What a privilege to look at the inaugural message of Jesus to the world. I mean, this is it. This is the first recorded teaching we have of Jesus in the entire New Testament. And inaugural messages are important because they set the tone. They give the vision. They lay the foundation for everything that he is going to do and build on in terms of his kingdom ministry in the next few years on earth. So that's why these words are so vital and, under, and, and valuable to our hearts that we need to take them in and understand them. And you know that we're focusing on the Beatitudes, verses 3 through 10 in Matthew chapter 5, which we learned last week are eight identifying characteristics of a true kingdom follower of Jesus. We're learning that the gospel of Matthew is the gospel of identity. It reveals primarily the identity of Jesus. It tells us who he is. And this book is going to be so rich in revealing the identity of Christ. And, and as Nathan has launched this series telling us that the call is to focus on Jesus, to learn Jesus, to discover more of who he is and get our lives in line with his. That's going to come to us in bucket loads in the days that are ahead. But the gospel of identity says more than that. It shows us what our identity is, who we are as followers of Christ. For as we go deeper into the true identity of Jesus, we will then go deeper into our true identity as one of his people. Identity is everything, folks. Knowing who we are according to who, what Jesus says is true about us, is everything. It's the most powerful and life-transforming truth we can ever discover, no matter how old or young we are. And some people think this is just for the young, kind of figure out who they are and get on with life. My goodness, no. Now that I'm one of the older, I get this, that it is all about continually embracing who we really are because we're always drifting away from who we are. We're letting so many other things tell us who we are, at least try to. So much of culture, so much of the values of the world around us, even well-meaning people in our lives, try to tell us who we are. We've got to keep coming back to the true source of our identity. And in the first 10 verses of Matthew 5, Jesus is literally stripping away our false identities, or at least our incomplete ones. And that can be a painful process. Believe it, but it's necessary. And he's helping us understand and embrace our new and true identity as his follower in this new and radical kingdom of God that he has come to inaugurate. So last week we looked at the first two identifying kingdom identities that Jesus blesses and affirms. And the first one we looked at, him giving us and conferring on us the identity of poor in spirit which literally means spiritual bankruptcy, that we have nothing in terms of righteousness to bring into this kingdom, into this relationship. We're absolutely bankrupt when it comes to any good we have in ourselves. All our righteousness is found in Christ alone. And that is the starting place and the foundation for all the other identifying characteristics that'll follow. We also looked last week at the identifying characteristic of mourning, those who mourn, which simply means to grieve over our own sin and the sin of the whole world. Well, today we're looking at the remaining six identifying characteristics. And remember this, these are not qualities we are commanded to try harder to develop. These are qualities that are simply true about us which we need to accept and embrace and by faith walk in as a child of the king. This is who you are. So Lord, in these minutes we have together in your word, I do pray that the love with which you delivered this message to those hearers on that hillside, those many years ago, God, that, that same love, Man, we just sang about that. You know, the same love. You love us all the same. Your love reaches to us all. It breaks through every wall. So God, whatever barriers there may be to us receiving this message of love from your Holy Spirit, um, we just say that barrier has no power here. It, there is no barrier that can stand in the way of your ministry today. So Lord, we welcome you 
and we embrace you and we listen to you and we're prepared to do what you say, what you ask us and to receive what you tell us from Jesus powerful name we pray amen i'm just going to read it again i think it's important we hear the the body of teaching that is verses 3 to 12 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we're picking up literally characteristic number three as we carry on and finish this passage today. So Jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of meekness. Blessed are the meek. How would you define meek? Many of us think right away of the word weak because, because it rhymes. Or being timid or placid or quiet and unassuming. You know, we all know that you don't get anywhere in life without, uh, w with being meek. Meek doesn't work at the workplace, in the classroom, you know, on the sports team. It's just not something, whatever it means, we don't want it, right? Because it just doesn't help us. But the meaning of the word in the New Testament for meek is this, being gentle, considerate, courteous. It's closely related to humility. And I mentioned last week that all the remaining identities in this passage grow out of the first one, poor in spirit. And you can see why meekness does, can't you? If there's nothing in me that makes me righteous in God's sight, nothing in me that earns God's approval, nothing in me that gives me reason for pride or self-dependence, then how can I put myself ahead of others? How is it possible? How can I make selfish demands of other people when I really understand my true spiritual condition before God. Rather, since God has shown me such undeserved goodness and kindness and love, then I want to treat people exactly the same way with meekness. If you look at some of the biblical examples of meek and humble people such as Moses, John the Baptist, Jesus, you discover that meekness is actually power under control. Think about that for a minute. Power under control. There was nothing weak about those three people that I just mentioned. But their great strength was controlled by their greater humility and meekness. And the promise is, the meek will inherit the earth. Now, this is a direct quote from Psalm 37, and it means to dwell in the land. In other words, the promise is that if you live as a meek person, you'll be given a place to live in the good land that the Lord is promising you, which is the place of his blessing, the place of his care and his protection and his provision here on earth, but ultimately in heaven. So child of God, true kingdom citizen, meekness is who you are. Question is, how are you living it out? in everyday life how willing are you to choose the path of meekness instead of pride and self-promotion next jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness so what's it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness just as clear as that an intense longing for God himself and his righteousness alone. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is so beautifully described in Psalm 42. You know these verses. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? That verse is the language 
of hunger and thirst. Woke up this past week one morning with the verse going through my head, your face, O Lord, I will seek. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. And I found it in Psalm 27, incredible verse that says, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. We read that very chapter in our Tuesday prayer meeting here. Uh, just clearly God, God's spirit, just speaking those words. That's hungering, that's thirsting. It's a desire to seek God, to get close to him, to be near him no matter what the cost. You know, the longer I grow in this Christian life, um, the more I'm discovering that hunger is the key to a faith that grows deeper and stronger. Hunger. I'm seeing that hunger for God is perhaps the most important key to keep growing. A hunger that never gets enough of him, that always wants more. A hunger that is filled only to discover that the fullness leads to more hunger. It's just this ever-increasing depth and cycle that goes on. You're hungry, you're hungry for God, he feels you. You get more hungry for God, he feels you more and more and more. That's what it takes to be a growing follower of the Lord. Never satisfied. That's enough. You know, I've got enough. I'm good. But it's always desiring more and more of him. Came across this great quote by a guy named J.N. Darby. He says that to be hungry is not enough. I must really be starving, starving to know what is in God's heart toward me. When the prodigal, the prodigal son, Ruth spoke on this a few weeks ago, when the prodigal son was hungry, he fed on the husks of corn that was food for the pigs. But when he was starving, he went home to the father. Hear the difference? We are all made with a hunger to be loved by a father. This is who you are. And that hunger ultimately finds its fulfillment in the father heart of God, in our heavenly father. To hunger for God is who you are. It's your identity as a follower of Jesus. The question is, what are you filling that hunger with? Lots of people fill it with husks of corn, with pig food, with spiritual junk food, with a quick um, sugary substitute that gives us an instant buzz, but just does not last very long at all. If you're not hungry for God, you got to check your diet. Think about what you're eating what you're putting into your soul, into your spirit. Consider fasting, something that I'm learning more and more about. There is something about us denying ourselves physical food for the sake of a greater hunger that God really honors. Fasting develops your hunger for God. So if that's something that God is calling you to or talking to you about, I would love to encourage you in it, support you in it. Uh, just reach out to me and let me know. It's something that I'm developing more and more in my life and absolutely loving it. Every time I do a time of fasting, I say to myself, why don't I do that more? God is so good. He is so faithful. Uh, he never, uh, how can I say this properly? He always comes through with something absolutely powerful from his heart to mine when I fast. It, there's rewards for it, folks. If anything, it's just creating a deeper hunger and thirst for God. Consider it, okay? I think it's a really practical way to develop that hunger. And if you're not hungry for God, really all you need to do is pray a simple prayer, and it's this, Lord, increase my hunger. Lord, increase my thirst for you. Lord, do it. Just pray that prayer and watch how he answers because he loves that prayer, and he will answer. All right, next, Jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of being merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So what does it mean to be merciful? It means to be compassionate, caring towards those who are suffering, to be loving and forgiving toward people who don't deserve it, just like we spent that moment this morning with Ruth leading us to forgive people. That was extremely powerful and helpful. That's what it means to be merciful. To forgive people who hurt you, with, even though they don't deserve to be forgiven. Merciful is more than a feeling. It's an action. 
It's action that alleviates suffering because we have experienced the mercy of God. Do you get it? Mercy comes from our experience of God's mercy. Now, we can't help the whole world. Certainly we can't. But we can certainly help those whom God sends our way, starting at home with our own family and then branching out from there as God directs. The key to being merciful, listen to this, folks, is having a soft, open heart. A heart that is open, a heart that is soft, not allowing our hearts to become hard, but to keep our hearts, listen to this, Nathan mentioned it in his prayer, soaking in the mercy of God for us so it doesn't dry up and harden. That's how we stay merciful. When we don't soak in God's love and mercy for us, our hearts have a tendency to get hard. We've got to stay there. We've got to let that water of his love, that pouring out of his love, just continue to soak us so we stay open and soft and pliable and ready and just all those good things. Satan, he has been trying hard during this pandemic to lock down our hearts. He has been hard at work to try to shut down the hearts of people, not just Christians, but all the people. I mean, he wants us to be so callous and over-familiar and frustrated and angry and everything else so that hard-heartedness starts to affect our relationship with him, God, and with others. That's his strategy. And when we get all frustrated and angry with the health measures and we just fight and resist and at least complain, you know, to whoever's going to listen to us, the danger there, the danger, and again, it's, it's okay to have opinions and that's fine, we understand that, but the danger in it is that we harden our hearts. We build a hard protective wall around our hearts. That's why we must keep soaking in God's mercy for us and respond to people then in mercy, kindness, and compassion. Merciful is who you are, child of God. It's your identity. Next, Jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of pure in heart. I think of all the eight identifying characteristics. This one has jumped out off the page to me the most. It's, I think it's really timely for us as a church and as God's people right now. The call to purity the call to holiness of heart, which is the thing most needed in order to see God more clearly and without distortion. I thought right away of Psalm 24, 3 and 4, which says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. A great picture. You know that Jerusalem is built on a hill, right? Literally. And this was the, the, the psalm of people who were on a pilgrimage, who were going to the temple, who were going to meet with God. The idea of ascending to the hill of the Lord or the mountain of the Lord is exactly the picture. That's where Jerusalem is. So who's going to get there? Who's going to get into God's presence? You know who? People of a pure heart. People that are holy before him. Now, I've taught this before, and you're going to remember that there are two things the Bible teaches about holiness. Holiness is both positional and it's progressive. Positional in that we are declared holy by God when we become a child of God. It's, we have been made holy uh, through Christ. It's a, called the doctrine of justification. Justification means we've been declared righteous, holy, pure. That is true of us spiritually. But holiness is also progressive in that we are being made holy as we grow in our faith. And that's the doctrine of sanctification. So, child of God, this is who you are. You are holy and you are becoming holy. It's all about our heart. What's going on in our heart. What we let go on in our heart about being pure in heart. As a matter of fact, just about everything that happens to us in life is a matter of the heart. I used to think the mind was the most important thing about us. What we thought, what we believed. That if we just believed the right things, then eventually we would do the right things. And it is important to believe the right things. It is. 
But that is not the case. Don't misunderstand. Both mind and heart are important, but in the right order. And I'm seeing this as I read the Bible these days. I cannot tell you how I'm seeing things so differently in the Bible now when I read the Bible. How God is so concerned with our hearts. He is primarily concerned with our hearts. He even talks about knowing in your heart. Instead of just get it in your mind, he says, get it in your heart. Like there is a relationship with the heart and with God that is so fundamentally important for us in our lives. Nathan reminded me this past week that the heart is in the driver's seat of our lives. It really is. It's not our mind that's in the driver's seat. Our heart is in the driver's seat. Our minds follow our heart and everything else does as well. That's why Solomon would write this in Proverbs 4.23. Above all else. I mean, this is the primary thing, folks. Listen, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Really? Yes. Everything you do flows from it. We live out of our hearts even if you consider yourself a thinking person, you know, not a feeling person, what is in our hearts actually determines what we do. And verse 8 says that the pure in heart will see God. I cannot tell you how exciting that is. The promise just, I don't know what it does to me. It just makes me come alive, motivates me, creates something in me that I can't describe to you. The ability to see God. If you want a reason for this, here's a good one for you. A reason to choose holiness, a reason to choose purity, a reason to go deeper in your life that really just, just want everything to belong to you, Lord. I just surrender to your lordship. You want a reason for that? You get to see God. Now again, let me be accurate biblically that when we belong to God, we're a child of God, we get to see him. We can see him right now. I mean, we, we can see what he's like. We can see what he's doing. Back to Psalm 27, we can gaze on the beauty of the Lord. We have an ability to see God because we have been made holy by him. The indwelling Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our heart, like Ephesians 1 says. We're able to see God as much as we can see him in this life. And you know that we can't see him fully. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says that, we see now as a reflection in a mirror. So our view of God is, of course, limited and earthly. And it says, then we'll see him face to face. That's a great chapter, by the way. Anyway, so we get to see God now. But I got to tr tell you this truth. Listen to this. There is so much more of God that we are able to see and that he wants to show us of himself. But there's a price to pay for it. There are some things that can only be seen by those who are willing to pay the price of purity, holiness, to draw near to God, and to let him reveal deeper and more amazing things. I was on a personal prayer retreat about a month ago. I went to Star of the North Retreat Center in St. Albert. And um, I've gone there quite a few times just for the day. They have a beautiful chapel and this chapel has these great stained glass windows that, you know, when you just sit there and kind of connect with God, they're beautiful to look at. They're absolutely gorgeous. There's a big star. I think it's Star of the North, so it's a big star. And then there's these rays that come out of it, you know, light beams. And then there's smaller stars. It's absolutely glorious, and I loved it. And it, it looks nice from a distance during the day. I mean, the North Star is always bright from the outside light. The smaller ones are, are more dull. And then I realized something as I was sitting there looking at it. That's how some of us as Christians live our spiritual lives at a distance from God. Kind of sit back and we admire him. Oh, he's great. You know, he is awesome. God is so good. And he is. And we have a relationship with him, but at a distance. But I never stayed there in the nighttime. I never was there in the, when it was dark out. So went back into the chapel at night, and everything changed. Let me tell you how. The window was now lit up from the outside. There was floodlights out there shining into the chapel from the outside, and it just changed this stained glass window in a beautiful way. And what I did was I, I came closer, walked up to it, and the closer and closer I got to the stained glass window, the light changed, and the whole piece 
changed so that now the big North Star was still bright, but when I got right under it, literally under it, looking up like this, the smaller stars were now full of light and they were radiating. It changed when I got close. There was things I saw that I wouldn't have seen. I would never have seen that during the day. But when I came at night, but then when I came really close, I saw things I had never, ever seen before. And God reminded me of Isaiah 45, verse 3, that says, I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. How do you get that stuff? You get it when you draw near to God with holiness and purity. That's the gift he wants to give us all. Oh, and by the way, the rest of that verse, which we don't often quote, he says, I will do this so you may know that I am the Lord. That's what he wants. Just wants us to know him better. Just to get connected with him in a deeper and deeper way. That's his call. What a beautiful promise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So the question is, will we pursue a deeper purity of heart so that we will see God more clearly? Yes, yes. Yes is all you need to say to that question. Pure in heart, this is who you are. Two more. Jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of peacemaker. And this identity of ours, it is so important and needed right now in this climate of tension, turmoil, the anxiety and conflict out there, to be a peacemaker instead of a disturber, peacemaker instead of an agitator. And how do we make peace in our world? By being at peace within ourselves. And how do we find peace within ourselves? By finding peace with God. Like Romans 5.1 says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're able to share that peace with whoever we run into. Actually, not you don't even need to say a word. We exude it. It's like that, those little stars on that stained glass, you know, they, they glow. They're, there's light in them. And when we just live our life, connect with people, we exude peace. And that is a powerful ministry. But we can take it a step further. Pray for the peace of people. Man, just think about going, walking through your world, folks, and just praying a blessing of peace on people. You don't even have to say it out loud. Just saying it in your heart. When you see somebody, Lord, bless them with peace. Bless them with peace. This is something actually God showed me at Star of the North, and he, he talked to me about the priestly prayer that the priests were supposed to use and how they were supposed to bless all the people, number six, and we sing that incredible song. But here's the blessing of peace that you could actually just say under your breath as you go through life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace give you peace, give you peace. Oh man, that, that's being a peacemaker. Let's do it, let's do it, because that's who we are. And then lastly, Jesus blesses and affirms you with the identity of persecuted because of him. Not an easy way to end this whole body of teaching, but it's the truth. It's the hard truth from Jesus, and he's good at telling us the truth. You know, if you, if you know and you live according to your true identity as a kingdom person, as a follower of the king, and I mean really live it. I mean really live it, okay? Like, that we really go for this. Then guaranteed, you're going to experience persecution. But Jesus here is not so much warning us about it and making us all afraid and, oh dear, you know, guess what's coming, guys? He's actually affirming us for it. In a sense, he's actually applauding us for it. Way to go, guys. Way to go. That's what he's doing. He is showing us how much joy it brings to him when any of his followers are willing to pay the price of persecution because of just being faithful to him. Anyone who would live for him so wholeheartedly that it would cause the evil powers of this world to push back against us. This is who you are. Whenever the unbelieving world runs into true faith, there's always a clash. I mean, two opposing kingdoms cannot hit each other without some kind of shrapnel. It is just happening in the spiritual world. That's increasing in Canada. Still nowhere like it is for our persecuted brothers and sisters who live in countries where Christianity is outlawed. But it's coming. 
Persecution from the unbelieving world, it's really only one aspect. There's another kind of persecution. I think it's more difficult. And I believe this is the kind of persecution Jesus had in mind when he first spoke these words. And that is persecution from the religious world. Even from God's own people. I get this from the way verse 12 is worded. It's he, Jesus says, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Who are they? It's obviously the religious system and its leaders. The Pharisaical uh, religion of works and performance that Jesus came to challenge and to offer true living faith based on grace. A religious spirit hates true faith. Hates it. Some of the worst criticism and attacks and hatred I've ever seen come from people who call themselves Christians and who don't like those who challenge the status quo with their faith, with their passion, with their boldness, with their love for Jesus, with their wholehearted devotion. And that hurts the most when this persecution comes from people who should be on the same team, part of the same family. I've experienced it. Many of you have. Some of you are experiencing it right now. So here's why you can rejoice and be glad when you are persecuted for Jesus' sake. Because, here's the reasons he gives us. Jesus calls you blessed. You have his approval and affirmation. Secondly, it proves you're genuine. You're the real deal. You're an authentic follower of the king. Thirdly, it purifies and strengthens your faith. Testing of your faith produces endurance. James 1, 4. Puts you in good company. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets that were before you. And finally, it results in a heavenly reward. Because as Jesus says in verse 12, great will be your reward in heaven. Now, all of that doesn't necessarily make persecution any easier, but it sure gives us a heavenly perspective on what is happening to us. So, patient listeners, let me wrap up this teaching with two questions. Two very important questions questions. The first one, you might want to share your answers to these in the breakout room, which I am assured by Nathan is going to work today. <laughs> it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. No glitches are coming. So here's what you can share, your response to this. Number one, which one of these eight identities stands out for you the most and why? Okay. Second question, how willing are you to discard your false identity and replace it with your true identity as a kingdom follower of Jesus? Realizing that this is no quick and easy process, it's hard, it's painful because it's dying to ourself and embracing true life in Christ. Jesus promises he'll do the surgery gently, slowly, thoroughly if we let him. And over time, we're going to start to see a new identity taking shape, changing the way we behave and the way we relate to God and to others. So if you want to start that process and get on the operating table, here's another simple prayer, which I'll close with. Jesus, show me who you are so that I can know who I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys so much.